for philosophy, the real difficulty lies in the spatial and temporal multiplicity of observing and thinking individuals. If all events took place in one consciousness, the whole situation would be extremely simple. There would then be something given, a simple datum, and this, however otherwise constituted, could scarcely present us with a difficulty of such magnitude as the one we do, in fact, have in our hands. I do not think that this difficulty can be logically resolved by consistent thought within our intellects, but it is quite easy to express the solution in words. Thus, the plurality that we perceive is only an appearance. It is not real. Vedantic philosophy, in which this is a fundamental dogma, has sought to clarify it by a number of analogies, one of the most attractive being the many-faceted crystal, which, while showing hundreds of little pictures of what is in reality a single existent object, does not really multiply that object. We intellectuals of today are not accustomed to admit a pictorial analogy as a philosophical insight. We insist on logical deduction. But, as against this, it may perhaps be possible for logical thinking to disclose at least this much, that to grasp the basis of phenomena through logical thought may, in all probability, be impossible since logical thought is itself a part of a phenomena and wholly involved in them. We may ask ourselves whether, in that case, we are obliged to deny ourselves the use of an allegoric picture of the situation, merely on the grounds that its fitness cannot be strictly proved. In a considerable number of cases, logical thinking brings us up to a certain point and then leaves us in the lurch. Faced with an area not directly accessible to, the, to these lines of thought, but one into which they seem to lead, we may arrange to fill it in such a way that the lines do not simply peter out, but converge on some central point in that area. This may amount to an extremely valuable rounding out of our picture of the world, and its worth is not to be judged by those standards of rigorous, unequivocal inescapability from which we started out. There are hundreds of cases in which science uses this procedure, and it has long been recognized as justified. Later on, we shall try to adduce some support for the basic Vedantic vision, chiefly by pointing out particular lines in modern thought which converge upon it. Let us first be permitted to sketch a concrete picture of an experience which may lead toward it. Suppose you are sitting on a bench beside a path in high mountain country. There are grassy slopes all around with rocks thrusting through them. On the opposite slope of the valley, there is a stretch of scree with a low growth of alder bushes. Woods climb steeply on both sides of the valley, up to the line of treeless pasture, facing you, soaring up from the depths of the valley, is the mighty, glacier-tipped peak, its smooth snowfields, hard-edged rock faces, touched at this moment with soft rose color by the last rays of the departing sun, all marvelously sharp against the clear, pale, transparent blue of the sky. According to our usual way of looking at it, everything that you are seeing has, apart from small changes, been here for thousands of years before you. After a while, not long, you will no longer exist, and the woods and rocks and sky will continue, unchanged, for thousands of years after you. What is it that has called you so suddenly out of nothingness to enjoy for a brief while a spectacle which remains quite indifferent to you? The conditions for your existence are almost as old as the rocks. For thousands of years men have striven and suffered and begotten, and women have brought forth in pain. A hundred years ago, perhaps another man sat on this spot, like you. He gazed with awe and yearning in his heart at the dying light on the glaciers. Like you, he was begotten of man and born of woman. He felt pain and brief joy, as you do. Was he someone else? Was it not you yourself? What is this self of yours? What was the necessary condition for making the thing conceive this time into you, just you and not someone else? What clearly intelligible scientific meaning can this someone else really have? If she who is now your mother had cohabited with someone else and had a son by him and your father had done likewise, would you have come to be? Or were you living in them and in your father's father thousands of years ago? And even if this is so, why are you not your brother? And why is your brother not you? Why are you not one of your distant cousins? What justifies you in obstinately discovering this difference, the difference between you and someone else, when objectively what is there is the same? You may suddenly come to see, in a flash, 
the profound rightness of the basic conviction in Vedanta, it is not possible that this unity of knowledge, feeling, and choice, which you call your own, should have sprung into being from nothingness at a given point not so long ago. Rather, this knowledge, feeling, and choice are essentially eternal and unchangeable and numerically one in all men, nay, in all sensitive beings, but not in this sense, that you are a part, a piece of an eternal, infinite being, an aspect or modification of it, as in Spinoza's pantheism. For we should then have the same baffling question, which part, which aspect are you? What objectively differentiates it from the others? No. But inconceivable as it seems to ordinary reason, you and all other conscious beings as such are all in all. Hence this life of yours, which you are living, is not merely a piece of the entire existence, but is, in a certain sense, the whole. Only this whole is not so constituted that it can be surveyed in one single glance. This, as we know, is what the Brahmins express in that sacred mystical formula, which is yet really so simple and so clear. Tatvam asi, this is you. Or again, in such words as, quote, I am in the east and in the west. I am below and above. I am this whole world. Thank you.